Hello, and welcome to season four of Scaling Success, a podcast geared towards entrepreneurs, where we discuss a range of topics that contribute to building a valuable and long-lasting business. If you're new to the podcast, please subscribe on Spotify and YouTube. I'm very excited to welcome my fellow partner at Volition Capital, Larry Cheng, as today's guest on the podcast. Originally hailing from Southern California, Larry is a 1996 graduate of Harvard College. He began his investing career at Bessemer Venture Partners before heading to Battery Ventures and then Fidelity Ventures, where our paths originally crossed. In addition to his day job as a co-founder and managing partner of Volition Capital, Larry is also active on social media, where he shares <laughs> observations and lessons from his life as an investor and lifelong learner. So if you like what you hear today, go ahead and give him a follow on X at Larry VC. Okay, Larry, great to have you today. Actually, our first live recording of scaling success. So this is exciting. We're breaking new ground. It is an honor to be on this podcast, finally. Right, I've, I've made the cut. You have, yes. finally. Our guests on this podcast are typically entrepreneurs from our network or folks who we have invested in. Um, the goal is, is usually to learn some lessons that can be applied by startup entrepreneurs. Today, I want to dive into the Volition founding story a bit. Great. Uh, because in addition to being an investor, you are also an entrepreneur. Uh, and, you know, after hearing a little bit about the Volition founding story, I want to mix things up. I usually, during the day, am fielding a lot of questions from entrepreneurs on a wide variety of topics. And today I want to put some of those questions to you. I'm hoping to learn a thing or two along with our Great. listeners. But before we do that, let's start from the beginning. Larry, I thought it would be interesting just to, to hear a little bit about your path to becoming an investor. So I graduated college in 96, as you mentioned, and I came out, I was in strategic consulting for a year and a half. And my investment career started at Bessemer Venture Partners in 98. And the reason I made that switch was because when I was consulting, I, I was trading in stocks, penny technology stocks. That's what I had fun doing. It was my passion. I was talking to people in the office about it. And when there was an opportunity to pursue an investment career in young tech companies that felt right on my alley. And I guess that's 26 years later now I've been doing it. I have never stopped having fun and it's just been a, a delight. So 26 years have passed yeah. since you entered the industry. Over that time, you've learned a lot. You've also built teams. You're still hiring all the time, yep. looking for new investors. What do you think are some of the qualities or characteristics that make a good investor? Well, I've been in investing for th uh, three decades across a number of different firms. And I don't think there's one model of investor that is the model. I've seen a few different types that have succeeded. One is sort of the deep domain expert that is passionate about a particular sector. I've seen it in security software to healthcare services to deep infrastructure tech. And these are the folks who are reading, diving in. It's their passion 24 hours a day. They're in something. Um, I've seen other people who have expansive networks. They know all the entrepreneurs. They they love people, they remember everyone. Uh, they're just relentless engagers with other individuals and, and their network is, is just ginormous. Um, I've seen very process-oriented, disciplined, financial people who have an approach. Um, you might think Warren Buffett's of the world, I would, might put into this bucket, Peter Lynch's of the world on the public side. Uh, and I've certainly seen probably more my, my alley, which is creative people, contrarian, willing to take risks and think out of the box. Those are four that come to mind, but um, there's different ways to make money in this world. There's different ways to help entrepreneurs, and, and I think those are some that come to mind. Great. So you've spent parts of three decades yep. evaluating entrepreneurs, trying to decide folks that you think are worthy of investment, people you want to bet on. Back in 2010, you decided to become an entrepreneur yourself. Uh, so perhaps you could tell the audience a little bit about the founding story of Volition. Why start Volition? Well, you were there with me. Um, we had this aspiration where Sean, Roger Hurwitz, and myself, we had the aspiration to build an independent firm. And we had all come from very established, successful firms. Sean came from Summit. Roger was running the growth, growth equity efforts at Apex. I had come from Battery Ventures and Bessemer. And we just aspired to build our, our own firm. There was a short window, and when the, when the uh, recession hit and the financial crisis hit, 
where there was an opportunity to spin Fidelity Ventures out. And I think we looked at each other for all of about 30 seconds and said, let's do it. Um, and we thought there was an opportunity to build an independent growth equity firm focused on the smaller end of the market. Uh, and um, we, we didn't miss a beat. We, we spun out and it's, we spun out into what happened to be a 10 year run of like low interest rates, which is probably the biggest fortunate hand we could have been dealt, a very difficult fundraising environment. Um, but a great time to invest looking forward. And so, um, so the, the rest is history. You mentioned that you, Roger, and I looked at each other for 10 seconds and decided to take this leap. We all were together inside of Fidelity Ventures. There might be a lesson in there for entrepreneurs about co-founders. In some ways, yeah. we're similar. In other ways, we're quite different from each other. What nuggets of wisdom would you share for entrepreneurs who are at the formative stages of their business considering who they might want to going to oh, business with? That's a great question. Um, we are both extremely similar and extremely different, and I, I think in ways that have been helped us be successful. Where we are similar is I think we are very similar in values, um, in terms of what matters to us, how we conduct business, the type of people we want to be. Uh, I think Roger, Sean, and I are, you are we're just very similar. I think we were very similar on what we wanted to do as a firm. So the strategy of the firm, the focus, there was no ambiguity on that. What's totally different is our approaches to investing. Um, where we, uh, Roger and I have op, uh, sort of occupied different ends and Sean's been somewhere there, you've been in the middle somewhere. Um, and um, I think that those distinctions have made us a much better firm when we talk about an investment, we talk about a company, we're coming from very different perspectives. Sometimes it's super helpful. Sometimes it's probably annoying to each of us. It's a great mix because it makes sure we cover our different bases uh, and you know, when I look back sometime decades from now and look back at the journey of Volition, I just know it would not have been nearly as successful without the differences that we brought to the table out of the gates. Larry, I suspect when you meet with entrepreneurs, you ask a similar question to the one I usually start most conversations with, oh, which great. is, when you started the business, what problem were you trying to solve? Maybe for the purposes of Volition Capital, what problem do you think we were trying to solve? What was that initial strategy and how has that kind of evolved over time? Probably the phrase that I would use is we help founders achieve their dreams without risking them. And what that means is our, our customer, our, our focus was on a founder that is more capital efficient, if not bootstrapped. That's always been our, our focus. And oftentimes these founders own most or not, if not all of the business that they're running uh, they have a very capital efficient orientation, and every day it's the largest business they've ever run. And where, what bringing on a capital partner means is there's risk. Um, and they know that venture firms, and they lose money two-thirds of the time. And so to put your entire net worth, and perhaps your entire identity, your life's effort into the hands of, a, of someone in VC who's used to losing money a majority of the time, that doesn't fit. That's not product market fit for the Volition entrepreneur. What they want is someone who can help them scale, knows how to expand sales, marketing, finance, ops, customer success, et cetera, go after the big dream, but not risk everything in the process. And so you win either way. And, and that's the seam where we were fitting, especially in the smaller end of the market, um, where there are a lot of young companies that are in that hyper growth phase where we fit. So, for the constituency of the entrepreneur, that, that was the problem we were trying to solve and the seam that we were addressing. There's also the constituency of our investors, which would be called LPs in our world. And for them, it's, it's the same thing, which is LPs are looking for upside without taking too much risk. And so we talked to our LPs about having outcomes that are 5x plus uh, capital return without risking capital too much. And so that's played out in our returns, which has been uh, perfectly aligned with our philosophy. So those are, those are parallel philosophies, one for the entrepreneur and one for the LP who are, two, who are two core constituencies. Good. Now we've been doing this for 14 years. So I suspect your answer to this question might have been different 14 years ago versus today, Great. but I'm gonna throw it at you and we'll, we'll see what direction you wanna take it. Why do you think founders choose to work with Volition Capital? I think in our business, uh, this is the most unsatisfying answer because I can't, I can't quantify it, uh, but I think you'd agree. I think it comes down to trust. Um, as I mentioned before, this is, the, this is a founder who 
this is their entire life's work. They own a bulk of the company. Um, they're, and they're capital efficient, so they don't necessarily even have to take capital. Um, that's a great place to be as a founder. You're not going to take on an investor you don't trust. Uh, so that's bar number one, and, and, um, and so that's, that has to be there. The next step is just a belief that with us as a partner, that the outcome can be disproportionately larger uh, with us than without us. That's sort of an accretive investor's role. Um, I like to think about the journey of a company, and if you just break it down into sort of the any, any phase, the early hiring phase where you're building out the team, to the scaling phase into the middle, to even the exit phase at the end, we should be a game-changing partner in every phase of that business's development. Um, and even just on one of those segments alone, we should be way more, uh, we should be worth way more than the dilution that the company took to have us on board. That's, that's our philosophy. I, I often say to founders, on the exit alone, we should be able to drive more value and increased outcome than the dilution you took for us investing in the first place on the exit alone, let alone everything in between. And so, um, so I think that's what they expect and hope for us as a partner is to be a game changer. I think you and I and Roger and others have found, had founders when we cross the finish line together, they give us a big hug and say, we, we would not have achieved this without you. That's the most rewarding thing. But you never get there if they don't trust you in the first place. And so I think those two go hand in hand. Yep. Obviously, you know, as we're now investing Fund 5, we have more resources. We have a bigger team. I totally agree. It comes down to trust. And generally, at the end of the journey, a lot of trust has been built. And hopefully, that leads to, to good outcomes. Um, tactically, though, we have a lot more resources yeah. to provide uh, portfolio companies. You know, you, you said something, Larry, I always cite this, but it stuck with me. Uh, one time we were in a partner meeting and you said our goal should be to have the best product in market for the entrepreneurs who are evaluating a capital partner. Yep. It's a journey. We're not standing still and we're always trying to get better. But can you talk a little bit about, you know, some of the different ways we're trying to build and deliver a good product to entrepreneurs? Yeah, you, you and I know in the early days of Volition, the, the advice and perspective came from you, me, the partners, and, and um, there's a lot of history and experience and pattern recognition in that, but we thought we could do better. And so we have built out uh, a strategic advisory board of just best in class operators in every functional area of a business, first rate CFOs, first rate CTOs, first rate CEOs, um, and every other uh, layer we're building an internal ops team with a bunch of senior operators who have scaled businesses, who, who roll up their sleeves and get involved with companies in a more direct way. That goes across in marketing, operations, sales. Um, and, um, and so we're building the sort of the, the tangible expertise to help uh, companies in more direct ways uh, and to complement the pattern recognition of the investors. And I think that's the best of both worlds. Larry, when describing kind of volition strategy, you mentioned that we are seeking to partner with entrepreneurs who have been capital efficient in yeah. the formative stages. In some cases, these are companies that have never raised capital yeah. before they pick up their head and consider a potential capital partner. Uh, if you fit that profile, by definition, it, it probably means you don't need to raise capital. Correct. Uh, but you are choosing to raise capital. I often get asked by founders of bootstrap companies, like when is the right time to consider raising money? I'm sure you get asked that question. I'd love to hear your answer to that question. Well, there's two primary uses of capital. One is growth capital, so the capital that you put into the business, and the other is secondary capital, is the capital that you take out for liquidity. Uh, in the first bucket of growth capital, the time to take capital is when you feel like you are not sufficiently investing in the company to maximize the outcome. And you feel like there are creative uses of capital that if you could put a dollar in, you can create $3 of value. And that might be through investment in product, sales, expansion, marketing, whatever it may be. And you're just feeling it. You're feeling like your balance sheet is constraining you from maximizing this opportunity. Uh, that's when you should be looking for capital. If you're not feeling that, I'm not sure that you should be. Um, I think there's a lot of merit in running a tightly held, uh, even bootstrapped company profitable. There's, uh, there's a lot of great businesses of that ilk. And so, um, but, but I think you should feel that. I don't think an investor should necessarily be the one telling you that if you don't feel that. 
Um, so that would be the, the use of uh, growth capital. There's also merit to consider uh, secondary capital. This is when a shareholder takes liquidity. Sometimes founders sell down a portion of their business. Maybe, as I mentioned, this is your entire life's work. Everything you've got is poured into it. You've put it on 10 credit cards and it refinanced your home. And maybe you can't take the risks with this business because everything is tied up in it. And taking a little bit of liquidity to cover some of your expenses will free you to run the business without thinking about your personal financial situation every single month. Um, I think there's merit to that as well. And we, we do investments that are on both sides of that or, or blending those as well. So I think those are probably the two. Good. One thing investors like to say, I think we've probably both said this, yeah. is that you have the benefit of pattern recognition because you have a broad portfolio of companies that are all on parallel journeys. Yeah. Um, entrepreneurs usually have a portfolio of one, so they don't have that same benefit of benchmarking and comparing. I'm going to ask you a couple of questions I also receive, and I'm sure you get quite sure. a bit. Um, how does that pattern recognition translate? You're now an investor. You're in the boardroom. When does your antenna go up and say, ooh, I don't feel comfortable with the direction things are going? What are the commonalities you've seen in companies that have maybe experienced challenges after a financing? Yeah, so we're not rocket scientists. Um, we just have the benefit of seeing a pattern play out time and time again. And, um, you know, I can't say it's one. You know, when you, when you have a portfolio of 10 companies like you do and 10 companies in your past, that's 20 sales teams. You've seen every sales hire. You've seen every head of sales. You've seen how each of those 20 companies has managed their sales performance and efficiency. You can look at a new company and say, well, this is what feels off. This is the mistakes that we've made and we've seen. And you can help course correct before a mistake is made on that dimension alone. Um, but that can be replicated. Um, you've done the same thing for marketing, customer success, global expansion, pr product expansion. Um, every C-suite hire, you've done you know, 10, 20 times. Um, every exit process, every financing process, that's probably 50 or 100 times. And so. Um, it's just the benefit of seeing what has worked and seeing what has not worked um, and trying to extend some of those lessons to an entrepreneur that may not have had the benefit of that. I would say this, though. Um, every company is distinct. Um, and so it's not that the way these three companies did it is exactly right for that company. But it's helpful to know <laughs> what's out there. Um, and I think that perspective sort of blended with the willingness to customize it for a, a particular company at a particular moment in time, uh, that's where it can be helpful. Good. There's always that fine balance to manage. We like to say internally that entrepreneurs drive results, yeah. not investors. Uh, we feel comfortable when the right people are around the table to drive outcomes. How do you manage that balance when you're in a boardroom and you have observations that you want to share, yet Ultimately, you want to defer to the management team and give them the confidence to, to drive forward with what they think is the, the best course of action. Um, I think Ty goes to the founder. Uh, uh, personally, I, you know how the way we're structured is um, there's a partnership between the founder and the investor. Um, and um, it's not, we don't want to be in situations where investors own the company and sort of dictate to the founder. It's always pretty much a, almost like an equal partnership. Um, but we respect the fact that if the founder has to live with the decision, the CEO has to run the company, um, and if there is a, a genuine disagreement, I generally think the tie goes to, to the, the person running run the business. Um, and, um, but I think it's a very healthy dynamic to have. It's almost like a marriage. Share your perspectives, um, but at the end of the day, uh, you got to have, the operator has to have conviction on where they're headed, and, um, and oftentimes I'll trust that. Good. Entrepreneurs that have been running a business for a period of time, they've been funding the company on the back of customer revenue as opposed to investor capital. One of those questions that is often on their mind is like, ooh, how is my day-to-day going to change when I bring in an institutional investor? What is the level of interaction yeah. going to look like? Obviously, there's benefit, but at what cost? 
How would you answer that question when, when asked by an entrepreneur who's contemplating that first round of financing? Well, for the sake of clarity, you, I, Roger, other partners, we do not want to run the business. If we're in that zone, that's a huge problem. We invest in founding teams and management teams to run the business. Um, the, from a, just a pure functional level, we are almost always on the boards of our companies. So the quarterly board meeting cadence is very typical. Um, a, a monthly call to check in on how the month went is very typical. Um, in between those zones, it's really, there's a pull. Um, there's more than a push. So if the founders are engaged in hiring and want our involvement in interviewing, we would be there. If the founder and, or CEO is involved in building out the management structure, we could have calls on that. If they need help closing a customer, uh, uh, in, engaging with a channel partner, we could be involved in that. Um, so that's where we want to be as helpful as the management team wants us to be. You and I, we love working with our companies, um, but we don't want to insert ourselves in where we're not necessary. And as, as our best companies have gone, as you know, oftentimes our best companies, at some point, they're, they're on rails. They're working. They're doing great. That the best thing for us to do is just sit back, and once we're in that zone, cheer them on and be as helpful as we can. Um, but, um, but that's kind of where we hope to get to. We have been fortunate to see some of those companies yeah. that have been on rails and gone on to have good success. Are there any commonalities you can draw across those big winners? Every entrepreneur out there wants to be one of those success stories. So I'm sure if there are any little nuggets of wisdom you can share, uh, that would definitely be valued by our listeners. Um, I think customer obsession is certainly one. Like business isn't that complicated, right? You need to solve a problem for a customer. They have to love your solution, and there have to be lots of those customers. That's what makes a great business. And so the, the, the companies and the management teams that are most customer obsessed build their entire business model around solving a customer problem, go the extra mile in terms of fashioning their product or service to deliver something that's above and beyond what competitors can deliver. Like, that is a great starting point. Um, and an adjacent aspect to that is if you can deliver that and build barriers into your business in the process so you can wall off competitors, that is also extremely helpful. And, and we've seen uh, barriers built in many different ways, um, from everything from just very deep uh, software that is, that is uh, very ingrained within the workflow of a business to tremendous customer success that no one else would try and replicate to network effects in different types of business. And so if you can have um, a, that type of barrier built against just customer obsession, that's, that's a great pairing. And then of course, there's the people. Like the, the best companies attract the best people. Uh, and uh, as you know, I think a lot of this world operates to a power law and I think talent is certainly one of them. And when we look back at our best companies, there's always some phenomenal people involved that you know, if they weren't there, you wouldn't have gotten there. We're sitting here in 2024. We're a couple of years removed from a market correction. You mentioned the 10 year period of low interest rates. We've now been in a couple of year period of increasing interest rates. Capital's more expensive. Is this a good or a bad time to be an entrepreneur? Um, I, I think it's always a good time to be an entrepreneur um, because great businesses are started in every single cycle, um, good and bad. I think there is actually a very special entrepreneur that is coming out of this cycle right now because there are entrepreneurs that have seen the era of free money, zero interest rates, uh, capital is easily attainable, and they've moved into a cycle where for in many segments, capital is really hard to attain. Profitability might be prioritized earlier. Um, and, and those two, if you've had both experience next to each other, you have actually uh, two plays in your playbook. Um, and I don't think either is right or wrong. It sort of depends on the environment that you're living in. And I really trust the entrepreneur who has seen both. Um, and so, um, so I, I think it's an exciting time. Obviously, like we're so lucky to be in the world of technology where technology has been a growth industry for decades, irrespective of interest rates, irrespective of the size of the venture capital and growth equity markets. And you can just see that being true for many, many decades to come. So in that sense, it's also a great time to be an entrepreneur because you have just the tailwinds of a lot of te technological change.
Yeah, we and the entrepreneurs we've backed have certainly been riding the wave yeah. of software as a service, internet adoption. Yeah, I certainly expect that to continue going forward. What is your outlook on the market right now? Where do you think the opportunities exist? Where are you hunting for potential investment opportunities right now? You know, it's kind of funny. I'm just very business-oriented as opposed to macro-oriented. Uh, I just love finding a business where they're really happy customers. Uh, someone solved a problem in a, a, a very specific way. You just have a stream of customers saying, I love this business. I kind of don't care <laughs> whether it fits into the theme of AI, which is super hot, to uh, digital health, which was super hot two years ago, to other sectors. Uh, I'm just enamored with businesses that have just, um, just raving fans as customers. So uh, in that sense, and I think for Volition as, as a growth equity firm, we're, not, we're almost against chasing the, the hottest cycle, the hottest sector. Um, we're just looking for great fundamental businesses that have good business models behind them. And we can get super pumped about that, irrespective of what sector they're in. One of the conversations I'll often have with entrepreneurs we invest in is managing the business that you're running today while also thinking about product roadmap going forward. Don't stand still. Yeah. Always be looking over your shoulder. Always trying to be one step ahead of the competition. You are an investor. You're also an entrepreneur. <laughs> How do you think about Volition Capital? as a firm and how it will continue to evolve going forward? I think good companies have a true north. There's a sort of a stake in the ground of this is who we are, this is not changing. Um, and as you know, for us, it's what we talked about in the beginning, which is to help founders achieve their dreams without risking them, to help our investors achieve upside without taking outsized risk. Um, there, there's a risk reward element, which is the true north of volition. Um, and, um, Within that true north, and this could apply to a company, or an operating company, then you need to expand within that, your ability to have product that goes into the market that addresses different needs. And so for us, that could look like extending from software to internet to consumer and perhaps other sectors down the road. It could mean uh, adding operating capabilities across different functional departments. Um, that's extension of market, that's an extension of service capability. But it's within one true north, which is what we established at the start. You need that stake in the ground. If you don't have that, this can happen to young companies, is you start chasing everything, um, and, and everyone's a little bit lost of what you're trying to accomplish. Um, and um, so that creativity to test and try new things needs to be constrained and disciplined within a clear focus of the business, um, which, is, uh, which I think is the right marriage. Great. Larry, I think you're always really good at distilling learnings from what's going on around you, whether it's interactions with your team, companies, entrepreneurs, et cetera. Another segment of folks who are probably listening to this podcast are up and coming investors. Yeah. People that are trying to replicate your journey, people who are trying to get into investing. It could be people sitting at their desk at Volition Capital right now. What advice would you provide them about how to pursue the crazy ups and downs that come with a career in investing? You know, I'm a conviction-oriented guy, as you know, and I, I think um, you've got to take in the feedback, be intellectually honest on investments, take in, do the fullness of diligence that you can do, and then you've got to trust yourself. Um, and... What you, and that's, that's the one thing you will have in your entire investment career, is you can look inside yourself and say, what do I think? The people around you may change. The markets may change. The areas that you're investing in might change. But what's constant is just your, your, your gut instinct, your perspective on the company. Um, I think you need to make sure that's informed. I think you need to trust it. Um, you need to trust it, especially when things are down, because you're gonna, this business can humble you. Um, and you need to make sure when things are up and things are great that you're taking in the outside feedback too. So it's always an informed opinion. Um, but what I've tried to do is, um, is develop just a clear sense of, of my viewpoint on something, and it's something I've tried to catalyze into the firm. Um, as you know, I haven't want this firm to operate in a mindset of we make group decisions where everyone has a kumbaya moment and agrees. 
Investments are not that obvious in the history of my career, at, even at different firms, the very best companies and investments we've made have been quite contentious, or at least there have been disagreements in perspective at the time, and there's always been someone who has heard that and had the conviction to move ahead, uh, and we foster that at, at Volition. Uh, it's, it's one of our core values, um, and so at, at, at Volition, you're not trying to convince the entire firm. Um, you're trying to engage with a partner who believes in you, and if that partner believes in you, this firm has to be there to support that partner, even in the context of differing opinions. Uh, and that's why I think it's so important to, to find your own instinct as you grow as an investor. I do think that's one of the surprises for people who walk in the door, is that we hire people because every voice matters, and sometimes the best ideas come from the most junior oh, yeah. person on the yeah, team. Absolutely. Uh, and having the courage of your own conviction to put yourself out there and risk looking silly. Oh, yeah. Because the rest of the room could be in disagreement with you. So there's always a balance there. I, I think uh, you've done a good job of instilling that type of culture where people have the, the freedom to, to kind of put themselves out there. Uh, and ultimately, that creates an environment where the best, best ideas win. Um, yeah, and, and, and that hopefully results in a good portfolio. One of our new partners, or newer partners, Tommy, coming up in this business was saying how, uh, he, you know, you, you, hear, you hear the word contrarian a lot as an investor and you grow up in this business. And now he's in the seat where he's making investment decisions. And um, he's like, it's a lot harder to be contrarian than I thought. It's yeah. like, you are, you're, you're, people are saying, people are looking at you funny. They don't see what you see. If you're wrong, you look really stupid. Um, but you know what? Some of the best investments, that's, that's what it looks like at the start. And so, um, so, yeah, that's the journey of an investor. All right, good. Well, Larry, thank you so much for taking time to you answer some of my questions today. You know, really tried to gear the questions towards some of those things that are usually on the mind of an entrepreneur considering, yeah. you know, an outside capital partner. So hopefully this Q&A is helpful uh, to, to folks out there that are perhaps fielding calls or, or emails from some of our analysts who are really the eyes and ears into the market for us. So uh, thank you very much and, and look forward to the, the next 14 years. All right. Thanks Delicious so much. Capital.